This weekend, we talked to Mark Abella, who is perhaps Japan's foremost libertarian and Austrian activist. Mark and I discussed topics like the Bank of Japan's failed 25-year program of monetary stimulus, the resulting creation of hugely insolvent zombie banks, and the impossibility of Abenomics. You'll enjoy hearing about Professor Toshio Murata, a Japanese student of Mises in the 1950s, who painstakingly translated human action in Japanese and is still alive today. And you might be surprised by Mark's revelations about the Japanese mindset, culture, and disturbingly high suicide rate. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist. Very pleased to be joined this weekend by Mark Abella, who comes to us live from Osaka, Japan, although he is ordinarily a resident of Tokyo, Japan. And as a result, he is well-versed in all things Austrian and libertarian as they apply to Japan in particular. Mark, how are you this weekend? Uh, I'm doing very good. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Mark, you're originally from Montreal, from French Canada. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Japan and how you became a libertarian and an Austrian. Well, I, I think uh, uh, traveling is a huge catalyst. Um, I, I think uh, going around uh, different countries and, and looking at the, the way some countries do some things better. Uh, why is this train here working well? Why is this train late? Why is this post office not working correctly? I think traveling helps um, open up. And I think it um, it forces people to look for that one universal equation that works for everybody. So it, it renders nationalism or whatever form of statism extremely difficult to embrace because you need to be able to, to embrace all these different cultures and, and be universally adaptable to a lot of different people. So I think traveling, uh, Mark Twain and others have, have said it in much better English than I have, um, but I think traveling is, is, a, is a tremendous catalyst for libertarian ideas. Now, of course, Mises had a Japanese student, Professor Murata, who still lives in Japan. Is that correct? Yes, uh, you're correct. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, as he was teaching in um, New York in 1959, um, in ni late 1950s, pretty much, was um, fortunate enough to, to enjoy a few scholarships. And there's this Japanese uh, young gentleman uh, uh, named uh, Murata Sensei, as we call him here in Japan, who uh, successfully got one of these scholarships. And he went and studied there and came back to Japan um, after he completed um, his year, I believe, between 1959 and 1960. And it was a tremendous time back then. He, 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 I mean, he still talks today. He's still alive, by the way. He's uh, 92 um, as we speak. Um, he would uh, meet, cross path with uh, Hazlitt. He would cross path with people like Ayn Rand. He would, uh, the place back then apparently was quite vibrant and so he came back to Japan and he actually translated human action um, in a very, very interesting way in that he made sure that every page in the Japanese volume of the first edition, at least it changed since then. But the first edition had every page in the Japanese edition um, exactly compatible with the content of the English edition. And, and he made it so that if a Japanese student who was not too good in English had a question on page 372, for example, he would just need to save 372, and the English student would immediately know what page he was talking about, which for languages as different as uh, Japanese and English is, is a tremendous ordeal. And so uh, he was a, a huge catalyst, I think, in the 1960s. Um, having said that, Japan, um, just like a lot of countries, um, have had uh, monopolies, uh, very statist monopolies in the media. And unfortunately, that has uh, cut a lot of generations, uh, we're not talking in, in years anymore, I think we're talking in, in decades, if not in generations, away from sound, um, from reasoning arguments, from an introduction to the way society works. The education also is, is unfortunately plagued by tremendous control from um, the central authorities. And, and if you don't go through the path of this control of this statist education, um, it's very difficult to apply for a lot of positions, to professionally explore a lot of jobs out there in the market. So they hold a monopoly that has uh, made it very difficult for Japan to have a liberty-oriented movement. However, the internet, I assume, just like a lot of places, and I think a lot of people today are extremely indebted to the Mises Institute. I know uh, I'm one. Um, the internet has provided a new, it's, it's, it's a new window opened 
Um, it's a new spring of thoughts. And obviously, a lot of young people understand they have to doubt more. Um, a lot of people are searching for ways to make uh, um, things work and, and things make sense. So indeed, the internet is providing a very new wind of change, um, at least in the mentalities. Uh, having said that, the Austrian movement, if you will, is still in, in a bit of in, in infancy, if you will. Mark, there is this enduring Western narrative with respect to the so-called lost decade of the 1990s in Japan that basically says the Bank of Japan failed to provide enough monetary stimulus to prevent deflation. Can we get your take on this? Definitely, there's no doubt. The, the yen was uh, brought into existence a long time ago, so it's got more than a few decades. We're talking about 1871 was the date the yen was brought on the market. Um, in 1980s, but not only then, but before, the yen has been heavily inflated. And 1980s, the rates dropped tremendously after, after a meeting that took place at, in New York called the Plaza Accord, for those who, who want to look into the detail. But, pro, but the Japanese government brought down the interest rates um, and flooded the market with uh, liquidity. And that fueled bubbles that I think a lot of people in the U.S. are not unfamiliar with. Um, because the Nikkei um, just went through the roof all the way up to 39000 And land in Japan also appreciated because banks were forcing people to borrow money as the Japanese government was trying to inflate its currency in order to be able to repay a lot of the debts. It was trying to include a lot of currency into a lot of liquidity in the market. And at some point, obviously, these uh, inflated prices, um, they, they hit that wall of, of complete irrational nonsense, and they just collapsed. And unfortunately, what they did is uh, what a lot of countries have been doing, especially since the recent debacles in the late 2000s. They've socialized a lot of the losses, um, and they've created what they call zombie banks. And so the the taxpayer pretty much has been, a, has been forced to pay for um, poor monetary policies in the 1980s. Um, Indeed, in the late 1980s, they tried to bring the rates back up. And I think that is what woke up. Um, that is what actually provoked a, a lot of bad investments to, uh, to collapse. But the, the problem was way before. The problem was already in the making for several years. And since 1991, if you will, um, Japan has not been able to uh, rebuild anything. Actually, we just uh, the recent numbers show that over the last 14 years, Japan has had over 30,000 suicides. Uh, the number is tremendous. Uh, the social problems are, um, the list is endless. Um, so uh, a lot of couples now, both of them have to work to make a living, not to feed you know, eight or 12 children. We're talking about enough to feed themselves um, and maybe at times one uh, child. So 1991, uh, a recession uh, brought on by an over- uh, amount of a huge amount of liquidity in, in, in the currency way too inflated. Um, 1991, they've socialized the losses. And since then, Japan has unfortunately not recovered. Uh, banks are still zombies. Banks actually, the, the central bank in Japan today is doing everything it can to, to inflate the currency. And it buys everything it could, it could put its hands on, starting from um, government bonds uh, to uh, ETFs, to uh, rate, to uh, real estate. Um, um, uh, equities. Um, it also, I, I think the balance sheet of the Japanese central bank has to be probably the most interesting thing to, 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 to study. But unfortunately, it's been two decades of socializing the losses of mistakes, which were obviously generated by the, uh, by the central bank in the 1980s, or which were accelerated, if you will, in 1980s. Do the Japanese people see the country's economic problems as having resulted from faulty monetary policy? Well, unfortunately, it's not introduced to them that way. I think uh, over the last recent year or so, there's this uh, new prime minister called Abe. Um, and his uh, new strategy, um, as they call it, Abenomics, is obviously print more, more, and print more. So it's inflate, inflate, and inflate again. And obviously what that does is it's, um, as the central bank creates, um, it, it adds liquidity to the market, a lot of the stocks um, actually benefit from that because they they buy a lot of commercial paper, they buy stocks, they buy shares. Um, and so it creates um, the illusion that a lot of prices um, in society go up. And so a lot of people today look, for example, at the Nikkei average, 
Um, and a lot of people are fooled into thinking, well, it's obviously going up. So this means that a lot of companies are making uh, greater money, eventually some profits. Uh, when in fact, uh, the narrative, the, the true, the, the reasoning um, narrative is that obviously it's just an inflationary process that's uh, translating into higher prices on a lot of different locations, starting with the stock market. So unfortunately, if you listen to the TV, the mainstream media, uh, I think the average uh, um, worker in Japan is ill-informed, um, ill-educated to understand, to see that too much printing was the problem. And as a result today, the government, at least Abenomics, as they call it, I think people do that in the US as, as well, Reaganomics and things like that. Um, it, it allows the government to keep on printing um, itself in a way to escape it, out of the crisis, if you will. Mark, tell us more about Abenomics and its supposed three arrows. Well, a lot of people have, unfortunately, a favorable image of uh, what Abe uh, and Abenomics um, is supposed to achieve. Uh, obviously, all three arrows, it, it goes back to an old Japanese uh, saying, which is that if you only have one arrow, it's a father that teaches his kids, uh, I think three boys or something like that, that if you have one arrow, you can break it and he breaks it on his uh, knee. But if you have three of them, um, they, they break, they don't break as easily. And it's a very... Uh, a communist approach to things, if you will. It's it's the commune is stronger than the individual, if you will. So he came up and he used that proverb and made it, he called that, his administration called it the three arrows. Um, the first element is to try to target inflation number out of the CPI, but obviously just like in most countries, the CPI is engineered. So the CPI doesn't mean anything. The equations have been um, um, played with. Um, and so they come up with the numbers that they want. The unemployment numbers also um, are obviously engineered. So I, they are succeeding, unfortunately, in fooling a lot of people um, and, and suggesting and hiding, masking the damages of an overworked, um, highly socially uh, uh, challenged society by promoting uh, numbers uh, that are completely uh, manufactured. So I would say, unfortunately, if you read the mainstream newspapers or listen to the Japanese TV, a huge amount of Japanese people, I, I wouldn't try to put a number, but I'm sure it's really high up there, um, work extremely hard, have very difficult lives, but when, and, you know, when they look and when they listen to the weather, man, they're told that this, you know, the sky is blue and everything is beautiful. So I think it, it must be a very confusing time for a lot of them. However, there's a growing internet movement and I hope that soon enough, uh, things will be able to stabilize. Do you think the demographic decline in Japan can be attributed to government policy beyond just the Japanese immigration policy itself? Well, I think uh, more and more, I think uh, uh, if you start from suicide numbers, um, as I said, we're over 30,000 a year. Uh, so that's, uh, and that's, they've actually topped that number for 14 years. So that's 420,000. That's more than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined in uh, and there's not even a war with anybody. So the, the numbers are um, are starting to speak for themselves. And I think a lot of people are asking questions, but um, the way uh, the education is built, uh, I think, unfortunately, very few people uh, are invited to challenge the integrity of the government. And I think a lot of the, the messages, um, you know, look at uh, North Korea or, you know, it's the Chinese or it's the American and so a lot of people are obviously, a lot of politicians do this, the game that a lot of politicians abroad do, which is they try to point in different directions. But uh, I think soon enough, uh, a lot of people will wake up to the fact that the distortions that we're going through socially are nothing but, unfortunately, man-made um, uh, policies. I think it was Mises, I think, in one of his books who said inflation is, is not a... It's not something that just shows up. It's a, it's a policy. Uh, it is a policy, and I think it's destructive. Um, uh, results are starting to show up, and I hope people will uh, will look into the numbers soon enough. Mark, from a Western perspective, Japan is a highly homogenous, high-trust society, and thus seemingly would be ideal for a more libertarian mindset. But from the picture you're painting for us today, it seems like the average Japanese is still mired in a statist collectivist mindset. Well, uh, it's interesting because unlike the U.S. or France or Germany uh, with uh, Emmanuel Kant or France with Diderot, Montesquieu and all these Rousseau, Voltaire or the people in, in America, the Japanese industrial revolution. So the winds of freedom hits the country in the late 19th century. So it's still very fresh um, in the mind of a lot of people in Japan. Um, this uh, self-reliance, 
um, self-respect. Um, um, in, in a way, the books are still on the shelves. Uh, if you look at a lot of the brands that you know, for example, from Japan, uh, Yamaha or Suzuki or Kawasaki or uh, Matsushita, a lot of the brands that you've heard, Honda, Toyota, um, are people that were pretty much alive uh, up until 30, 40 years ago. Uh, unlike uh, the brands that you have in the US, for example, Cadillac or uh, Chevrolet, uh, th these were people from probably a, a bit further away. Um, and so the, the winds of the industrial, industrial revolution in France and in other places, um, which we typically assign to the 18th century, in Japan came later. It came as a result of the influence of Japanese people who traveled to Europe and came back with these ideas. So indeed, Japan is still full it's still riding a bit on the orbit of in, an industrial revolution, if you will, that was uh, that it's, you still have these uh, this this wave. Um, but unfortunately, the um, uh, I think the state is um, has gained tremendous ground. Um, I think in the 1920s, 30s as well, it was a bit of a despotic um, empire. There was an empire in the making. And um, a lot of the lies are still uh, to be understood, to be studied. So I would say currently, if, we, if you want a score, I think the state is still winning. But I think the Internet is, is hopefully going to be a, a game changer for a lot of people. Well, it's interesting that you bring up brands. I suppose the once mighty Sony Corporation is almost a metaphor for Japan itself at this point. It seems to be disappearing. Well, I think you can say that about uh, almost all the brands in Japan. They used to have a really high quality uh, they used to have a very powerful, uh, private, uh, thriving uh, sector with a lot of brands that a lot of people used to enjoy in um, electronics and in the car industry and in cars and in, in TVs. Unfortunately, that is uh, dying away. And unfortunately, I have to say, it's really, really difficult. The um, I think I saw a video that you made recently where um, obviously the, the, the central bank at some point when it takes too much space and it prints too much money and it buys a lot of the assets that shouldn't be bought, um, uh, and it, it creates so many distortions that it's extremely difficult to make any form of viable private business work properly um, because the, the government, the state, renders every attempt uh, almost impossible. And so no price actually reflects any form of true demand. Uh, no no actually uh, business is actually there because there's a huge pool of customers. Most of the businesses obviously are there because they've succeeded in stealing away money from the government. So a lot of the brands that we, that you uh, and I probably know that we've enjoyed younger, um, cars, Honda, Toyota, Matsushita, uh, Sanyo, and all of these brands that actually come from family names for, for most of them, of people that were alive up until you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, are going through extremely difficult times. But all these uh, uh, challenges are not because the private businesses themselves are not doing too well. Uh, it's just become impossible to make sense of what the market, where the market stands due to the tremendous distortion that the central bank is imposing on society by all the infl inflation it's creating and all the fake numbers it's producing that's hiding, masking the, the damages. So Mark, as we wrap up this interview, let me just ask you this. Is there a future for the liberty movement in Japan? Well, I think just like everywhere, um, uh, the liberty movement um, has to go and uh, um, source a lot of its energy in um, young generations. I think I'm, I'm starting to understand that uh, students uh, have probably to be um, the, uh, um, the engineers, if you will, of liberty, if liberty has to have any form of success in society. And I think uh, we're seeing more and more people study uh, through the Internet. I myself, I have to say, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have you today and, and to be able to, to admit that I have a, an intellectual debt um, to the services that you've been providing. Uh, because it's, uh, I mean, you, you have allowed a lot of people um, around the globe to relearn and to unlearn. I don't know if these words in, exist in English. And I think uh, the, the Japan will also is slowly but surely taking this orbit as it's trying to have a new generation of people asking more questions, looking into information that was not made available to them. And I think uh, the future, uh, the last decades obviously have been uh, plagued by um, um, a turgescent government, but I think the upcoming 10, 20 years should be extremely interesting. And I, I think we will probably live events like the ones we saw probably in the past, uh, revolutions probably of 1776, 1789, or even stuff that was closer to us, if you the Berlin Wall or the Tiananmen, 
I don't understand exactly everything that happened there, but I think we will in the next 10 to 20 years in Japan uh, see revolutions. And I, I, I hope that the internet will feel some of them uh, and that things will work out for the better. Mark Abella, thanks so much for your time and for a fascinating interview. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.